Welcome to the Missouri Valley's Mobilizing Voices for Change. I'm Kelly Burke, and joining me today are three former Valley basketball greats. Let's start. Dolph Pulliam is the captain of the 1969 Drake Final Four basketball team. He's considered one of the best defensive forwards of his time and is enshrined in the MVC Hall of Fame and the Iowa African American Hall of Fame as well. Carl Nix is the tough-as-nails lefty who helped lead Indiana State to the NCAA championship game in 1979, a year the Sycamores went 33-1. and He went on to play in the NBA for the Nuggets, the Cavaliers, and the Jazz. Carl is currently a scout for the Indiana Pacers, and last year his jersey was retired at Indiana State. And Chris Lowry was a standout point guard and coach at SIU, part of Floorburn U., five NCAA tournaments, eight MVC championship squads. In 2007, he guided SIU to the Sweet 16, and Chris was inducted into the Saluki Hall of Fame in 2019 and is now the associate head coach at Kansas State. Gentlemen, great to see you all. Thank you for being a part of this. And let's start by reminiscing a little. All three of you were part of some of the most historical squads in Missouri Valley Conference history. What do you remember about your magical seasons? And, and for some of you, there was many magical seasons, but we're going to focus on a couple in particular. Dolph, let's start with you, that magical 1969 Drake season where you went to the Final Four. One of the things that I remember most is that you took a small team uh, that was unheralded, uh, came in, coming out of a small little city that nobody could pronounce, Des Moines, Iowa, um, we didn't have all of the equipment or the fanfare or the practice facilities or anything that the big schools had, but we made it to the final four because of our determination, our guts, our hard work, and the ability to play well as a team and as a coaching staff. That is what I remember most. And, uh, you know, that's a lesson that all of my teammates have learned over the years that carried us into our careers just hard work, the, being the underdog and uh, accomplishing things that no one uh, could have ever expected uh, you to accomplish. Carl, you were a part of that infamous 1978-79 season. Um, you guys had a, a phenomenal run that year. And so tell us a little bit about that season and what you remember. Uh, well, you know, it, it was magical. Um, you know, we was a small school, Terre Haute, um, and we we had a bunch of um, just average guys on that team. Um, but then we had Larry Bird, and uh, you know, with his leadership and everything, it turned out to be such a phenomenal season. Uh, I just remember that you know we were just you know just regular guys, and and we we made a, a, a we, we said to ourselves earlier that year. Hey, let's just take one game at a time, and uh, and next thing you know, um, we just ran through the country. So, but it was it was a it was a a lot of a lot of guys who were great role players um, that did their roles perfectly, pretty much. And then then we had Larry, who was just phenomenal, phenomenal as a leader and everything. So it just turned out to be one of those histor historical uh, times uh, in basketball for us. Chris, you, you have a lot of seasons to, cho to choose from, um, both a, as a player under Rich Heron and obviously as a coach um, throughout your time in Carbondale. But, but let's focus on that 2007 Sweet 16 season because that's the one that Saluki fans talk about the most. Obviously, it's a great time um, for, for Saluki fans. Uh, we had such a good team, great chemistry, just led by Jamal Tatum. Uh, Tony Young, obviously those two seniors were just phenomenal guys that really allowed me to push them. And then they in turn pushed our guys. And uh, we were so hardworking, blue collar, you know, lunch pail type of team. And it just bonded. And we clicked with the community. We clicked with the, the Saluki Nation, like they like they like to call themselves. And it really just formed a lasting bond that way. And played together. We weren't selfish. Um, as a former player there, it was good to see that um, how they embraced um, the university, um, not only athletics, but everybody involved. And, and it, was, it was a good time 
uh, in Carbondale. But I got to speak about Carl, man. And and I know Carl, man. I'm I'm from Evansville. Carl knows. I was a little. I was seven years old. I was like, who is that? Do-? Like you know, everybody knew Magic and everybody knew Larry. And I'm a little guy, so I always look like who's the guys handling the ball, who's the guys doing the, the dirty work, and that's kind of what player I was. And um, to see that happen, and to know I'm only two hours from Indiana State, and I almost went to Indiana State for Coach Locks out, out of high school, and a lot of it had to do with that team, that that team, and knowing Larry Bird and all those guys, all those guys played there, and uh, big things could be done at that place. So I had to give a shout out to Carl, and they hired my boy Kyle Cheney the other day too. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, good so just, you, just, just great memories of NBC times and, and, and learning about the league. And I think that's something that my generation probably was the last generation that really paid attention to who was before you. Like kids nowadays have no idea who played where they even played. And uh, <laughs> to know guys in the same league is unheard of nowadays. And I really watched and paid attention to who was, who was where, and I always got other people's, you know, when they sent out their questionnaires and their books, I would read up on who the best players were, whoever played there were, because that was interesting. There was no internet. So you had to find out through magazines and journals. So um, excited to be on the call and, and knowing who's on this call is, is, is that much more important. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. We recently wrapped up the presidential election. There's still a lot of unrest, a lot of work to be done. On and a lot of healing, frankly, that needs to go on in this country. As three men who understand the importance of teamwork and the value of teamwork, what would you tell our elected officials about bridging our differences in this country, especially politically? And Carl, let's start with you. Well, I just want to, you know, say be open, uh, allow people to see the human side of you. Um, you know, be be approachable, be reachable, um, and 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 whatever you ask for someone to do, uh, give them the confidence that it's something that you would also do too. But be available, um, uh, and 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 I would also say, you know, treat your staff or whoever it is uh, as if you want to elevate them, to bring them up. Um, and, and, and not not this um, this separate division type of situation that I've been seeing a lot in the country, um, because I feel like as a leader, you you are as good as the ones that you are leading. Uh, so um, and they and you and and if you give that example and work hard to be a good leader, then then the people that's following you will work hard to make you look good. So that that becomes a team, and you have to be extremely unselfish. And 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 looking looking at the for the greater of all and to just to really elevate people and I think I think that's what, what that's what needs to be done, and I just say hey you know put your guards down and let people see the human side of you you know uh, be don't 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 be afraid sometimes to be vulnerable, um, and and be open so that's that's my advice. Thank you, Dolph you know, given all that you learned about teamwork at Drake, what would you tell our elected officials about bridging our differences? Well, I think one of the first things that I would tell them is that remember history. If you learn from history, what history has taught us, all of the struggles that folks before you have gone through, African Americans have gone through in this country, uh, the division, the racism, um, you know, History is so important to what we do today. You know, just quickly, you know, my history is that I was I was born in the cotton fields of Mississippi. My mother gave birth to all nine of us in front of the fireplace in that one room tin roof shack that we were born in because in Mississippi, the Ku Klux Klan ran things down there and we couldn't do anything. Uh, you couldn't go to the hospitals to see the doctors. You couldn't go to restaurants or whatever, but, but through that, you know, from that beginning, I've learned a lot about how to work with people. You know, folks would say, well, why aren't you, you know, racist? Why aren't you, why don't you hate white people? Well, because for me to get to from Mississippi to what I achieved today was because of a lot of folks, both black and white, 
that helped me along the way. And so when I talk to our leaders and I, I say to them, look at our history, look what, look the struggles that we have made. And now from there, we have got to open the door to a better America working together, black and white, getting rid of division, regardless of racism, trying to eliminate the racism that we, this country has, which is a, which we've been talking about all my life and I'm 74 years old now. We've been talking about that all of my life and I still face that today, even, even in, in, in my life, as I walk, go through this community, I still see it and face it. But by the same token, there is hope. There's a glimmer of hope and we have to work with each one of us individually one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, black and white, be together, be seen together, working together, communicating together, socializing together. That is what America is. And that's what makes our country so great today. But we don't see enough of that because the, the current leader of our country has allowed this country to break up into division. This, the current leader in our country has allowed America to, to deteriorate and go back into what the country, the country that I grew up in. And that is what I tell our leaders today. You've got to look forward, you've got to lead, and you've got to take away the leadership from those folks that are trying to tear America down. But you've got to help them build America up. Thank you, Dolph. Chris. Wow. I mean, those, those sentiments are so true. And um, I think when you look to our past, you, you look to people who've actually gone through the sit-ins and the marches and all those things that where it comes full circle now, um, where it's actually, you know, nonviolent protests, um, being met with police brutality, being met with police resistance. I think, you know, we, we need healing through paying attention to those in need. And, and that's the bigger issue um, is, is that we got to find a way to understand that the biases that we have that are outward or hidden have to come to the forefront. We got to tell the truth to everybody. And we have to understand that there's, there's a profound effect on this, this next generation of, of, of kids who believe that change can happen. You know, when obviously when Dolph grew up, when all of us were growing up, we never thought that there would be a black president. There was something that we never fathomed. And we always, and you know, made fun like that, that'll never happen and it happened. Um, now, the next thing is 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 the is the the unhidden racism, and and being able to to eliminate that, being able to just make sure everybody understands how we can help each other, and and taking pride in that, and that is America. Having pride in being American is not being a white American. That is that is not the reality of of America or the world. Like you know, so we got to understand that. Just trying to make sure everybody is educated. Um, Everybody is willing, willing to heal and, and, and not have these biases and not be allowed to outwardly speak about how my race is better than yours. Um, that is something like, like Dolph said, that's, that is something that's being promoted by the person in charge of, of, of our, our country is supposed to be the greatest country in the world. And we're promoting an image um, that is not um, what, 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 when our forefathers thought of it, that's not what we broke away from. We didn't want to go back to that and, and have that be the circumstance that we're in. Thanks, Chris. Dolph, the, the next question is for you. As you mentioned, you were born in the pre-civil rights South in Mississippi under Jim Crow laws and the, the Ku Klux Klan. You then moved with your family to Gary, Indiana, which was also segregated at the time. In fact, I, I was, I didn't realize this, but the only contact that you had initially with whites was playing sports. Mm -hmm. How much of an adjustment was it when you started college at Drake? Wow, uh, that's a good question. That's a tough question. It's an emotional one for me to answer because um, in a sense, I'm sort of embarrassed because when I left Gary, Indiana and, and uh, went to Des Moines, Iowa to attend Drake University. I went from a black world, predominantly black world, to a predominantly white world. And that means that I had to acclimate myself uh, to a white environment. 
I, and uh, that was tough for me. Um, as a black kid growing up in the South and throughout, you know, I learned because I had to watch my people being hanged in, the, in Mississippi as a kid. But I learned not to look white people in the eye. I learned not to disagree with white people. I learned uh, always uh, to, to be, dis, uh, be courteous and, and never try to upset folks, white folks. So when I arrived in Des Moines, Iowa, um, my, my speech teacher after two weeks said to me, Adolphus, I need you to stay after class. I need to talk with you. And I thought I'd done something wrong. So I stayed after class and she said, son, she says, I noticed that you don't participate in our discussions and you don't talk. Um, she says, is there a problem? What's, what's wrong with you? And I had to tell her that I was afraid that if I said something and I disagreed with someone who was white, I had this stigma that something bad was gonna to happen to me. And so she, she brought me out of my, my cocoon by telling me, son, I'm gonna teach you something. I want you to hit your sternum to a star. She says, this is your sternum. And that is the star up there. And she says, if you hit your sternum to that star, you will always look up. You'll always look out. You will always talk to people. You won't look down again. And that is the thing that changed my life in, at Drake University. Then my other, the people, my coaches and others helped me come out of my shell and become a more active, a talkative person. I learned a lot at Drake University. Drake is a, means a lot to me because Drake helped me grow up. Drake nurtured me and taught me how to be a, um, a competent young man at that time, a hardworking young man. So, so to me, that's how my university helped my, me change. Dolph, why do you think Mr. Shaw took such an interest in you? You know, I've always thought of that question, Kelly. And uh, um, she saw in me what she said later. And she saw a potential of a young man that had so much potential inside and just waiting to burst out, but was afraid to let, to open up and allow people to see inside of you. And Mrs. Shaw uh, taught me how to open up and how to allow people to come in and how to trust folks. And that was key, trusting that I wasn't, something wasn't bad wasn't gonna happen to me uh, when I opened up and started disagreeing with people or, or speaking my mind. Mrs. Shaw was only there in my life for one year at Drake University and then she retired and was gone. But the lessons that, that she started with me lasted my entire lifetime. Thank you for sharing that. Just, just incredible. Carl, you grew up in Chicago and you attended a high school that was primarily black. You said on your recruiting visit to Indiana State that Larry Bird treated you like anybody else. How did your worldview, especially it change when Larry Bird became your first white teammate? Well, you know, everything was just a shock for me. It was a big time culture shock. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Carol Holt, that community, that culture, anything like that. And then, um, because where I'm from on the south side of Chicago is, is predominantly all black. My high school was predominantly all black. And um, so, like I said, I had to learn a lot uh, about people at Indiana State. But when I, when I met Larry, Larry embraced me. He put his arms around me. And uh, not only did I learn about that culture, I also learned about the country French League culture also, which was another shock. But, but by him embracing me and uh, making me feel comfortable, um, and um, I, I was easily adapted to it because the best thing for me was to get out of that environment that I grew up in because that's, that's not, it wasn't a healthy environment at that time. You know, it was just, a lot of gang bangers, gangsters, uh, a lot of drug users, drug dealers, 
uh, con men, hustlers. So I wanted to get out of that and make something of myself. But uh, until I was embraced by, you know, Larry and some of my other teammates, I got comfortable. Then I had to learn this whole culture. I had to learn it. I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know how to act, didn't know how to talk, didn't any of that. And uh, I hung in there and dealt with it because, you know, I said, well, I'm going to make something out of it because I didn't want to go back to that environment because I know what that was like. And I just embraced it, worked hard, uh, stayed out of trouble, uh, and hung out with those teammates that was from that culture. And then I grew to learn it, and, and, and it's been one of the best experiences of my life. What did you teach Larry about your experience as a black man? That, 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 that the, the labels aren't true, uh, that we're lazy, that we are this, we, we steal, we rob, whatever the labels are, that, that has been put on us, none of that was true because he looked at me and I was a hard worker. I was a good person. I was a good citizen. I was a good teammate. Um, um, I wasn't no liar. I wasn't no cheater. So all those things was erased. And when he looked at me, uh, I think he realized that because as I speak today, Larry and I are still friends. And we talk about since, I'm talking about since 1976. And Larry is not easy to be friends with. You know, if you say boo to Larry the wrong way, Larry gonna cut you off and he gonna mean it and he would never talk to you again. I got a thousand of stories like that, that Larry, hold, Larry is still holding on 30, 40 year resentments as we speak about one incident. And so for me to sit here and say, uh, Larry learned a lot about me and, and learned to respect me and uh, he would never say it, but I know he loved me. He would never say it uh, and I helped him. But um, um, I, t I taught him those things. I taught him those things. And I taught him that, you know, it's, 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 it's players like myself that plays hard, uh, didn't, want to, didn't want any credibility, cre credit for it, just wanted to play and be a part of a team. And I was a great teammate. So I taught him a lot of those things. He would never admit it. You can never, ever get him to admit, to admit that. But that's the truth. And I know that. I bet the, the stories that both of you have are just legendary about each other. <laughs> yeah, uh, man, yes. So, um, but like I said, uh, it was a blessing for me um, and an honor to, to, to learn and grow and be around Larry. Uh, uh, it's a funny story. Um, I'm, I, I, uh, Terre Haute, Indiana State was my first visit uh, on some on some, a line of some small schools, but that was my first visit. First time I had flown uh, before, and I went down to Terrell Hole, and they had started telling me about this, this phenomenal guy named Larry Bird, this white guy. I was like, yeah, right. I'm in Chicago South Side where all the best players are at. And it's nobody, you know, I'm talking about Isaiah Thomas, Doc Rivers, you know, I'm, I'm playing Maurice Chiefs, I'm Ricky Green, I'm playing with the best of the best. And they're going to tell me, trying to sell me about some Larry Bird. And so, but back at that time, you know, the NCAA wasn't so hard on schools, this, that, and the other. So they put together a pickup game and teamed me up with Larry. And, and the only thing I could say to myself was, oh, my God. I ran to the phone, called home, and, and uh, told some of my friends, and even Isaiah Thomas said, I've just seen a white freak of nature this Larry man it's gonna be awesome and so at that time I told you know I, 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 that was my recruiting visit so at that time I told the coaches I said hey look you ain't got to sell me no more I'm not going on those other visits I'm going to sign and play with this guy right here I want to play with Larry Bird I'm going to sign and that was it and that was history and from that point on uh, it, it was just it was all history Amazing. Chris, uh, most people know you as a coach and, and as a player. I was fortunate to, to see you and how you are as a father. And I think that's, that's a role a lot of people don't get to see you in. But I got to see you in that uh, for all the years I got to cover you in Carbondale. And one of your greatest gifts in life is the legacy of your son, Kahari. The, the 15 years he spent on this earth before his passing in 2017. 
how do the lessons that that hobby taught you, especially about unconditional love, continue to show up in your life today, especially right now in these times of COVID and in a country that seems so divided and, and is in need of healing? I think when you deal with a special needs child in itself, um, you have to learn how to love differently. Um, and, it, and, it, and it changes from your, your, your other kids because they're able to do the things that, that he can't do. So you, you find ways to do so much for him, with him, to be able to do some of the same similar things that, that your other children can who, who have no, no disabilities. And, uh, you know, it, the biggest thing for us, we wanted to make sure that he, wherever we went, he went. There was not a vacation we went on. Um, several of the trips as, as a team that we went on, my son went. You know, we always used to make jokes. Uh, you know, hobbies going wheelchair and all. Wherever we're going, he's going. And 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 I don't think people understand uh, what that means. The, the 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 ability to have to set up things ahead of time to be able to to accommodate your son. And that's something we learned. Not everybody accommodates uh, people with disabilities. Not everybody accommodates handicapped people. And we were shocked once my son got older at the things that people didn't want to accommodate and didn't want to allow. And that really taught me a, a lesson about, you know, it's not about race, it's about love. If you can't love somebody who may not be able to walk or talk, that is a, that is, you're, you're not a good person. And, and, and to be able to reach those people, my oldest daughter was great at it. You know, she, she would see people looking at my son and say, well, his name's Kahari, he speak to him and he'll smile to you. She, she made people feel uncomfortable people who felt uncomfortable get real comfortable with my son and what and his and what 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 it, what it, the issues that he had um she did not want you to stare at him she wanted you to get to know him and she taught us you know that it's okay it's okay to 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 feel you know sad but it's not okay to not love your child because of shortcomings she was a she was really the first one that really chastised other people to understand what it what it means to be a, a, a sibling of a of a young person with, with disability. She she was so great. Um and, and we never asked why. I think that's the, the other thing. God blessed us with him. We never asked why we loved him. Um, you know, one of the, the most proud moments I have of my son is that he was baptized um two years before he passed. And that's something that that's so hard. Um to say outwardly now with so many people wanting to make things politically correct uh, in a way that it, it, that it does include some of the best things about being a human. And that's being a Christian or that's being a part of um, a family. And that's something that we, we took great pride in our family. We went to church together. We did everything together and, and, and we didn't hide that. We talked about it. And maybe some people didn't like me for that, but but we felt that we, if we could just reach people and show them what it's like um, to not be divided, to not be discretionary about our love for our kids outwardly and not be just a basketball coach 24 seven, because so many people want you to just be that 24 seven, just be the coach. We don't care about who you are. We don't care about your kids. We don't care about your personal life, win us games. And we never were that way. And I think it's made my kids grow up better it's made them be better people. Uh, and it's helped me and my wife deal with very tough times because, um, you know, there's more to life than a bouncing ball. You know, I had to learn that personally. What was I going to be after the ball stopped bouncing personally for me? What was next in my life? How could I move on and go forward? What was the next way I was going to grow up and, and to learn how to be a man? So um, we just, we did a lot for him. He did a lot for us. Um, he did a lot for every community that we were in. And we were surprised at his passing, how many people from different jobs where I work came and supported us uh, in both Manhattan and in Evansville where he's buried. Uh, we had two funerals and both of them were huge. And um, the love that that only 16 years old, you know, on this earth, what he meant to so many people. Your family certainly stands out to me. I had the privilege of covering you, gosh, for probably four or five years in Carbondale and some of my best memories are, you know, at, at Thanksgiving, you guys always invited me to your Thanksgiving and Erica cooked up a, a big feast and I got to be around 
Gahari and Lexis and CJ and, and Jasmine. And, you know, I, I just can't say enough about your family and, and the unit that you guys are. The next question is for all of you. Uh, you. You all grew up in different decades, but still in a time where athletes really didn't necessarily use their voices. What are your impressions about today's college and pro athletes who are now using their platforms and their voices to speak up on race and the social issues going on? And Dolph, let's start with you. Yeah, I'm the old guy in the group. <laughs> we grew up, uh, it was a different world, uh, more intimidated uh, by society and, and, and what have you. But, I, but the, the young men today, the young men and women athletes today uh, speak their mind. And I like that. Um, they, they, they stand up for what they feel is right. And they will speak out against what they feel is not right and what is wrong in society. That is a good thing. You know, I, I have to say, though, you know, Colin Kaepernick, when he kneeled, and I'm while I was watching television, when he took his first knee, I thought that was the beginning of something that was going to change America. And Kaepernick paid the ultimate price for that because he's never been able to get a job in the NFL because of that, what he did. But what he did he, he gave all of us uh, a, a little bit more courage to stand up and to speak out. And that's what our, our young, young men and women are doing today in athletics. They're using their athletic abilities uh, to help change America, not just in college, but as you can see in the pros as well, and in major league, all major league sports. Uh, when athletes are speaking out, America is starting to listen. Sure, there's some that say, well, just because you're speaking out now, I'm not going to come to any of your ball games, and I'm not going to uh, write a check as a corporate sponsor for you. That's fine. We'll continue to live with that. Young people have made that, that, uh, that move for us, and I like that, and, I'm, and I give them all the credit for what they're doing today. Just keep it up now. Keep in mind now, they've started something we got an opportunity um, uh, to change America and let's keep our eyes on the ball and let's keep pushing forward. And I think we'll, we'll help America change. Carl. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I actually worked um, for four years in player development. I was actually working directly with our players or uh, sort of as a mentoring role. And I used to I used to tell them all the time. I say, you know, um, these young guys out here that's emulating you guys, especially young young black uh, young men out here that's totally lost, is dropped out of school, or whatever they're doing is totally lost. I said, you know, they would listen to athletes of any sport pretty much, and they would listen to these entertainers. You know, you can get their attention right away. So I think you should speak up. And what I do like about them that is, is that they they do utilize their platform in the right way. Uh, some of them, but not all of them. And I just I just I I I uh, I, I don't envy that at all. I just I, I just know it wasn't like that in my time because in my time it's like if you speak your mind, you can you can actually get blackballed and, and get out and be out of the business or maybe get kicked off the team and stuff like that. So time has progressed for the better. Uh, and I do like the fact that these, these athletes uh, like LeBron and these guys are speaking up, telling the truth. And they can say some things, they got some, a lot more freedom. They could say some things, like they have said things about the president that, that I'm like, oh my God, that, that we're not even thought of right now. You know, even calling them names and stuff like that. Um, and 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 I'm I'm glad that they're speaking up. But on the flip side of it, I also tell these athletes, you know, don't let it be a show for your brand. You know, um, be true to be be real and be true to what you're saying, and not for some attention seeking type of stuff. Because some of them are like that were also. But I do like the fact that they're making a stand, standing up, sticking together, and, and um, it's it, it's real good. Uh, um, and and I can't. I, I only thing I'm doing at this point right now is 
when I'm around some of these guys, I just totally encourage them to speak up because it's not about you. It's about bringing somebody else up and helping somebody else because I'm telling you, this generation that, that, that's under us, they're struggling. They need help, you know. A lot of these college guys, when they come to our place to work out for us, and I had the opportunity to take them out to lunch, I drill them. I drill them about coming to this league or just society, what you need to do to give back. Um, and so I'm, 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 uh, it's totally different now. These guys got so much uh, freedom of speech, so to speak, versus in my time where you had to be so careful. So, but I, 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 I like it and I support them. Yes. Well, I think for me, for, um, you know, I'm, I'm at the ground level where I'm, I'm with the student athletes on a daily basis. And in July, you know, after, after George Floyd was killed, we had an incident on our campus where a student made some uh, remarks about his death. And, and this, this student had, had prior had racist rhetoric on his Twitter and, and stuff. So our entire student athletes uh, formed together uh, and they put out a, a statement saying they would no longer play and no longer play or compete unless um, this student was dealt with. Now, th what that means is this: um, on the on our side, any any staff member, professor, coach, uh, anybody who works for university, if they spew any racist rhetoric, anything demeaning culturally to anybody, they are fired immediately. Um, but the students are protected by a certain code of rights and a code of ethics separately from the adults, which should not be that way. And so what happened is our student athletes, to their credit, used their platform uh, and they got the president and board of regents to agree to change the student code of student code of conduct in three weeks, in less than three weeks, which it takes months. You know, they talked to six months to a year to change something like that in a state legislature about the code of ethics with our students uh, on our campus and it happened. And, and we, we completely supported them. We told them to use their platform and we told them this is the number one thing. In these times, they cannot tell you no. If they tell you no, then you know they're racist. And, and that's where our guys and the, and the ladies really stood up and, and they became adults and they became activists. And, and we told our guys, activists don't run away. Activists don't change schools be some, because somebody said something racist. They stand there and fight and make it better. And, and I think that to see it visually happen, to see our guys go into meetings with other student athletes, black, white, male, female, um, it was great because they were learning how to interact with people. They were meeting with the president. They were meeting with, with, with which was unbelievable, obviously by Zoom because we're in COVID times which is another way of them learning how to act in a Zoom meeting, sitting up straight. Don't be laying in your bed. Just like stuff that we as adults know, know, but sometimes they don't know those things. And we treat them like that. We treat them like they don't know to see, but to see this happen in a matter of weeks. Um, well, for me, I was, I, I was full of pride to see our, our young men and, and women stand up for something and, and to fight racism head on, not back down, and make a statement and say, we will not play unless this change. I would have never thought about doing that as a player because number one, I love ball so much. I was willing to be get in line just to play it. Well, I'm not going to do anything that hurts me and my ability to play ball as an 18, 19. These, these guys, several freshmen who hadn't played a down or a snap or a game for us were in these meetings and felt the same way. So they had no fear of not, you know, having their scholarship revoked or having their, you know, scholarship check taken away. And that and that's when you know you got something when they're willing to fight when when it seems like everything they care about is taken away. Chris, you're a, a member of, of BACA, the Big 12 Black Assistant Coaches Alliance that was formed. And the, the core values of that are to educate, to unify, to serve, and to support Big 12 athletes and coaches. In what way has the mission of BACA impacted Big 12 athletes and coaches so far? Well, I think when we talked about doing this, um, it was, a you know, right after the Big East has the same coalition uh, and that we, we got together and, and we started talking about how we can mentor our own student athletes because we're all in predominantly red states for the Big 12 
is at. And we're all we're all in, in, in communities, a lot of them where it's a predominantly white community, um, where the only place they see our student athletes is in on the playing field. But as they're in the community, several of our, our guys felt like if they didn't know who you were, they were afraid of you. And, and that's something that, you know, as a player, you don't care about. Uh, but when you get older and you see it as a grown up, it, it, it shocks you like you don't know who that is. But most of the football guys have helmets on. So a lot of people don't know unless it's the star player. Uh, but basketball guys, generally, we we everybody knows who they are. But we wanted to educate them on voting. We wanted to educate them on their rights as, as human beings. We want to educate them on, um, you know, how to deal with the police. We wanted to we wanted to educate them on um being financially able to service yourself um, and learn how to deal with coming into money. Um, you know, and, and we wanted our guys to really just learn um, that there is, there is another way to go if you're not a professional athlete. And when the ball starts, stops bouncing for you, what's next? How can you be a productive citizen? How could you not leave college without a degree? That was our number one thing is to don't get used up. And, and consistently talk about making it. And making it doesn't mean making the NBA. The percentages are extremely small. Making it is being a good father and husband, being able to provide for your family. And, and so those are the things that we, we started BACA and, and really wanted to keep on the forefront. And, and this is a hard thing to do in a highly competitive conference where all of us are recruiting some of the same people and we meet every Sunday. And we all laugh and joke about, we didn't used to like you over there. I didn't like you and I, we didn't like each other. But because of Baca, we bonded with all the assistants in our league. And, and it's unbelievable how, how much we talk now, which we never talked before to each other, only in recruiting, only when we saw each other and stuff like that. The competitive juices completely went away when it came, when it came about, our, about, our, about our student athlete. Amazing. Carl, you used to say growing up, I'm going to dribble myself out of this environment. What would you want people to understand about the challenges of where you grew up in Chicago? And you alluded it to it a little bit earlier about the gangbangers and the con man, con men and some of the stuff you were dealing with. Yeah, I just know, um, you know, I still have family members uh, live in the environment. I still got friends. My dad, um, you know, my, my dad was a minister in that environment for 54 years. The church is still there. And I just know it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of life. It's narrow-minded. Um, and uh, I used to have to say things to myself to motivate myself, to keep myself motivated to make a difference, to get out of that. I had was blessed with a talent. I knew I was blessed with a talent. Uh, I had a mom and dad at home, and uh, I would say these things, and that just stuck with me. I'm gonna dribble my way out of this here and and uh, get to college or get a scholarship or whatever. And, uh, and, and I used that to motivate some of the younger guys that kind of followed behind me. And I did it. I actually did it with a lot of work and a lot of determination, staying out of trouble, not getting into the gangs like I was, you know, tempted to and, and did some things that I shouldn't have done, but but it was it was all about being involved in the church and also being being around some great coaches, some guys who took me under their wings as father figures for me and 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 and, and, and put me in and exposed me to different tournaments and this, that, and the other, and I played some different sports, but my main thing was, yes, I'm going to dribble my way out of this, and I did, and I wanted to send a message that it don't have to be with basketball, but you can use the same motivation to get out of the environment because uh, you owe it to yourself, and if, and if you got a gift, like I realized I had a gift early, and, and, and now what I, the message that I give back when I do my public speaking to young to teams and stuff like that is that if you don't utilize the gift, what you're saying to God is thanks, but no thanks. So utilize the gift that we all have been given and then we have different gifts. And I use that a lot when I speak. And so my thing uh, actually 
dribble my way out of that, it still rings the bell in my head. And I use that as I speak now to keep me going. Uh, I, there's some young guy came up to me the other day and asked me, uh, what makes you keep on going like this shit? Because I was working out at the health club and I just said, hey, I have a gift and I'm still using it. I'm not actually getting paid to play or anything, but I have a gift. I'm still using it. Until, until it's over, it's over, but it's not over. I'm still using it. And that's the message that you have to tell these, these younger guys. So I always use I'm going to dribble my way out of this because that wasn't a healthy environment. I, I, I love the environment. I'm, I, I'm proud that I'm from that environment. It made me a tough as nails. It made me edgy. It made me not give up. It made me not quit. It still made me be a fighter, tough, um, made me be a better person, better dad, better husband, better everything. But uh, the thing is, to all these young guys and, and young girls that's trying to make a difference, dribble your way out of there. You can, especially if you have a gift, just work at it. Well said, thank you. Well, you all realize that, that so many, so many times people like to label athletes. And Dolph, this next question is for you. What kind of impact did your college coach, Maury John, have on your future when he stressed to you that you were more than just a basketball player? I'll take you back to my when, when I was being recruited. Um, uh, there were several schools that wanted me in college to play basketball football. I had more offers to play football in college than I did for basketball. But my coaches had said, you can go to these two schools, and this is the one school I want you to go to. And they told me, okay, Indiana is the school that you're going to go to, all right? So I visited Indiana, and unfortunately, the, now that the head coach was busy, and he didn't have time to meet with me, so the assistant coaches took me around and showed me everything. And then I left Indiana, and, my co and, uh, and I wasn't happy. My coach said, okay, we're going to make an announcement that you're going to go to Indiana tomorrow. So they put it in the paper that I would be going to Indiana. Fortunately for me, how the good Lord works, I had to play in an Indiana basketball all-star tournament a few weeks later. And I'm playing in that tournament, and I had to guard a guy by the name of Butch Beard. And um, Butch was killing them in the first half. And coach said, I said to my coach, look, switch me on the beard. I want to guard Beard. And he said, but Beard's a guard. You're a forward. I said, I don't care. I'm going to guard him because he's killing us. So I went over and guarded with Beard, shut him down, and we beat the Kentucky all star At the game ended, Butch and I are standing on the floor talking. And Butch said, pull him. He said, I am so glad uh, that you're going uh, to Indiana because I'm going to play for Louisville. And we'll never see each other again. Because the Missouri Valley, the, uh, the the Big Ten don't play anybody in the Missouri Valley Conference, and we laughed, and then we hugged, and, and he went his way. There was a white man standing there as we were talking, and as soon as Beard left, he walked. He said to me, "He says, uh, my skin is on cold." And I said, "Well, thank you, sir." And uh, he says, uh, "I'm going to talk to you for a minute." And the conversation went on. I said, well, look, coach, I got to get a shower. I got to get to the restroom. I got to get, get on the bus to get back to Des Moines, to uh, Garrett. He says, well, I just prayed that I get to meet you, get to talk to you. And I stopped. And I said, uh, who are you? He says, my name is Morris John. And I says, well, Mr. Johns, I never heard of you. What do you uh, and, and what do you do? He says, I'm a college basketball coach. And I said, well, coach, I'm going to Indiana. I'm going to Indiana. He said, well, that's what I heard. And I'm not trying to recruit you. And I said, so what are you? He says, well, he says, son, he says, I saw how when your mom died, she left all nine of you kids by yourself. And your 17 year old brother became the head of the household. And your aunt came down to uh, Southern Missouri from Gary, Indiana and brought all you kids to Gary and she raised you. She said, and every one of you kids graduated through high school without a mother. And he says, and he noticed, he says, for your last two years, you've been uh, captain of the football team, captain of the basketball team on the National Honor Society. You, you are taking care of your, because you're the, the last three left in the household because all your older brothers and sisters are gone. 
and you're doing the cooking and the cleaning of the house, and you and he says you're in the National Honor Society. He says, son, I've never met a kid like you before, and I just wanted to shake your hand. Can I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, what are you going to major in in Indiana? And I said, well, coach, they haven't talked to me about that yet. And he says, well, this, you're supposed to tell them. I said, coach, nobody's talked to me about my education. He says, what happens if you go to there and after four years, all you have is a degree in basketball reading? How are you going to get a job? And I said, oh, coach, that's easy. I'm going to play for the Boston Celtics in the NBA or the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. He, oh, you are? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he says, well, son, what happens if you don't get drafted into the pros? You don't graduate with a degree. How are you going to get a job? And I says, coach, I don't know. He says, son, we need to talk. If you come with me to Drake University, I promise you that in four years, you will have a degree, one that you can get out there and get a job with. And then if you get drafted into the pros, then God bless you. I, he says, now what do you want to do? I said, coach, I want to go with you. And that's how I got to Drake University. That is, a, that, that is what saved my life. That man saved my life. And that's what you coaches, both of you here, do to kids every single year. Every young man that you're recruiting, you, you change their lives. If they listen to you, if they follow you, if they if 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 they do the things that you ask them to do, if you if you get a degree, you have helped them change their lives. And some some don't see the benefit of it, and they go, they get passed along the way. They fall out. They drop out of school. Their their lives are lost forever. They're embarrassed. And 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 you heard. I know that whenever we had recruits that came to drink and didn't and flunked out of school. It hurt me. It hurt so much to see them leave because I say, they just missed a great opportunity to make something of themselves. And they didn't do that. That's what we did. That's what I wanted to do at Drake That's what my people helped me do. They helped me realize that there was something bigger for you, Pulliam, than just playing basketball. And we are going to be somebody. You're going to be somebody. And when I graduated, the Celtics drafted me in the NBA. The Dallas Cowboys drafted me in the NFL. And, and, and I said, wow, you know, coach was right. People would notice me if I worked hard, if I did what I was supposed to do, if I kept my nose clean. Then I turned them all down. Yeah, I turned them down and became a, te a television broadcaster, you know, because my professor said, this is what you need to do, dog. This is your legacy. You will open the door for other African Americans to come along behind you in broadcasting, and and that was the first. I was the first African American television broadcaster in Iowa, and after that, it took a couple of years, but they started hiring others. So that's how my life has changed, and that's what coaches can do for you. That's what my coach did for me. And that's why I applaud any any of you, all you guys, because you, you're doing a great thing to help young people. Thank you, Dolph. Carl, how did you get the nickname, Mr. Intensity? <laughs> you hit Larry uh, Bird, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, um, I didn't know any better. I only played with one speed. Uh, which got me in trouble uh, when I got to Indiana State, um, and and uh, but it but it worked for me. So what happened was that uh, at my freshman year, um, when I got a chance to play, because I didn't never thought I was gonna get uh, you know when, when when you get out there you got to make it you had to give it your all because I never thought I was gonna get another chance. So I went full blast, nonstop. And what happened my freshman year, nobody knows that I had my own fan club and Larry Bird didn't. And they actually labeled me Mr. Intensity because I'm just gonna guard the full court pressure by myself nonstop. And, and they kind of gave me that name. And then I kind of liked the name and kind of start using the name myself and start playing it with it. So that's how it all kind of came about Mr. Intensity. 
and I'm and, and my high school coach say, hey, um, against anybody, you play like it's your last, and you give everything you have and leave it out on the floor, and that just stuck with me. And uh, I I just don't think you you should play the game if you don't play with intensity. When I was coaching, I was like, get on guys all the time. I'm like, where's the intensity? That's it, it, to me, it's a waste of time. So, so that's how I, I kind of got the nickname from the fan club and stuff like that, and just kind of like adapted to it and started loving it. So that's where it came from, really. Nice, and it, it's clearly clearly stuck. Chris, one of your prized former players is now the head coach at SIU, Brian Mullins. What advice? He had a great first season in Carbondale. What advice have you had for him for year two? I think you're muted. Brian is somebody that obviously means a lot to me because, uh, I mean, most people don't know this. I was at Illinois as an assistant, and then when I left, Illinois to be the, the head coach of Southern Illinois. <clears throat> I told I told his father, you know, we we needed, a, you know, I said, nah, we don't need a point guard. I'm not interested in him. And so, after a month of seeing, you know, my team and seeing what we had and where we needed to go, I had to call his dad and say, look, I made a mistake. You know, I, we need your son. And um, you know that that's kind of the, the history, is, and that's why. His dad was like, dude, you never lied to me. You told me the truth. Uh, for a guy to say he doesn't need my son and then go and evaluate and then come back and say, I really need your son. <laughs> that, he said, and his dad is full Chicago. <laughs> and he said, it takes a, a, a lot of you know what's to do that, to, to come up here and tell a guy you don't like him at all. And now the next time I see you, you say you love him. So. <laughs> so that was my relationship with his dad and, and, and the rest is history. Brian was a starter from, you know, I was stupid. I didn't start him the first two games. And I was trying to figure it out with some of the other guys and be loyal to some guys that were already in place. And um, I think we started out two and four that year and we started Brian. I think we won 14 in a row uh, from that point. And the rest is history. He's freshman of the year. Great year ago, the NCAA tournament. He won the Missouri Valley Conference tournament uh, his freshman year. Um, he had a game winner at Creighton, and, and he's just that—he's a winner, man. And and to, for me, it was so hard to see him. We we lost to them to go to the Final Four. So Loyola beat Kansas State to go to the Final Four, and I had to do the interview on the court with our local uh, local radio station. And for me to see my own guy out there in the middle and confetti falling down, it was almost like slow motion. I was so pissed, but then I thought, I was like, man, that's my guy right there. I, I, I had to change up. I gotta be, I gotta be happy for him. You know, and, and and he looked at me and I knew he was like, he wanted to say I'm sorry, but he wasn't gonna do it because he was going to the final four. So <laughs> he was happy. He was sorry that he beat me. I'm his guy, but he was happy as hell to be going to the final four. And uh so. So to see him operate like that, I knew he was going to be successful in whatever he did. 4.0 student, first team academic All-American. Um, he had that grit, man. Just like, just like Carl, like that intensity. Every he he did same person. He picked up every single possession, full court, one man press himself, his whole career. You know, uh, and, and that's who he was. Defensive Player of the Year in the Missouri Valley, Defensive All-American. Uh, and, you know, we, he, he was just like a boxer. He kept coming back every single day. And I talk to him every week still to this day. He calls me. He asks me for film. He asks me, you know, about situations. He asks me, how do you deal with stuff? And um, to me, it, you know, and I tell him all the time, man, I'm not – you don't play for me anymore. You don't got to talk to me like that. You got to – like, you know, he's like, coach, I can never treat you like my peer. You know, I played for you. And that's that's what I love about about him as a person. He gets it. Uh, and, and year two, I mean, he got a great freshman. He had a freshman of the year. I think they're going to build on that. And all of us are fighting this COVID stuff. And I think that's going to be not only his biggest thing he has to deal with, but across the country in, in, in college sports and high school sports in itself, in itself is fighting this thing off and being protected. And the, the mental health of these young people right now um, I can't imagine when I was 17, 18, 19, people tell me stay inside, 
don't go nowhere, don't do anything, don't meet new people, um, wear a mask 24 um, seven. You, you can't go to your girlfriend's house anymore. Like stuff like that we took for granted, they, they literally have to watch because they know if I get COVID, that means my roommate has COVID. That means my teammates have COVID. You know, and that's the, that's mm-hmm. the reality of, of, of what's going on in this pandemic. I love that you two are still so close and talk so often. As we close this conversation out, Dolph, I'll, I'll leave the last question for you. And I would be remiss if I, if I didn't inquire about this. I, I was fascinated to learn in my research that your neighbors growing up were the Jackson family, as known as Michael Jackson, the singer, and the Jackson Five. What childhood memories do you have with the Jacksons? Oh my! Well, uh, they were they were athletic fans. They weren't athletes, but they were athletic fans. They loved coming to the ball games to watch me play basketball and, and watch me play football. And so they became um, some of my greatest fans. Um, their their family was very strict and very regimented. So those kids were not allowed to, to, to run free, as you probably heard and read and whatever. But their father kept a pretty tight rein on them. So uh, I'm going to fast forward. I graduated from Roosevelt High School, went off to college, graduated from college. And then I went into television broadcasting. And it was uh, 1971 or 72. The Jacksons came to Des Moines, Iowa, to perform at the Iowa State Fair. And so uh, my television station manager came into the newsroom and he said, the Jacksons are in town, the Jacksons are in town. He said, I called out to the hotel to try to get a set an interview up with them. He said, but they won't even talk to me. He said, man, if we only knew somebody that could get to the Jacksons, we could control the market tonight. So everybody sat there dumbfounded in the newsroom and then I said, well, let me try. And everybody looked at me and said, you, why do you think you can get them? I said, well, because I grew up with them. And so they said, okay, you get them. So I called out to the hotel, got the road manager. And he said, uh, Mr. Roach said, uh, Adolphus Pulliam. He said, is this the Adolphus Pulliam from Roosevelt High School in Gary, Indiana? And I said, yes, I am. He says, Adolphus, what are you doing in Des Moines, Iowa? And I says, well, I work for the local television station here. He says, you do? He says, how would you like to interview the Jacksons? And so I got, that's how I got the interview. So anyway, he says, get out to the hotel, get set up, and I'm going to surprise them and bring them into the, into the room. And I won't tell them it's you. So the door opened. I told the cameraman, now when the door opens, you hit the switch on that camera and you catch whatever goes on there. So the door opened. The Jacksons are standing over their heads down. And then they looked up and they said, Adolphus Pulliam, it's Adolphus Pulliam. Oh my God, it's Adolphus Pulliam. And they rushed into the room and they're all jumping up and hugging me and said, and Michael says, Adolphus, you left Gary, Indiana before I can get your autograph. He says, I gotta have your autograph. And I said, okay, Michael, how do you want me to sign you? He said, to my best friend, Michael, from Adolphus Pulliam. And I said, you got it, Michael. And I signed the autograph for them. And then it went on. So that's my story about the Jacksons. And, and I had been friends with Michael. I could go out and visit him at his hotel in Las Vegas whenever he was performing. Could go up to the room, spend time with him until about 1986 and then his management team. And they wouldn't even let me get near him. So that's my story about the Jacksons. It was a fun, fun, fun thing to happen. That's impressive. That's big time. Yeah. Wow. Good story. <laughs> wow. Hey, that's amazing. <laughs> well, as we, as we close it out, I just want to thank the three of you. Thank you, Dolph. Thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you, Chris. You. This was thank just you. incredible. The, the stories, uh, the, the perspective, especially for someone like me that's a white woman, just the era that, that each of you grew up in, especially... Dolph and, and Carl, what what you went through, um, just the different times that it was. I, I just, my, I, 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 there's not even words to describe some of the stuff you, you said, but I appreciate you all so much. Obviously you were phenomenal basketball players, but I think we can all appreciate that you're even better people and, and coaches and, and 
contributing mem uh, contributing members of society and your community. So, so, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much.